Anyway, we always like to start on time, and according to my iPhone, it's one o'clock. So I would like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Stephen Kunkel from the Cadillac uh, Richland Clinic. Come on up. <laughs> Lucky guy. Uh, all right, can everyone hear me okay? All right. Um, so thank you for inviting me to come speak with you today. I, I think up here, up here, better? I feel like I'm going to be licking an ice cream cone or something this whole time. <laughs> Anyway, thank you for inviting me to come out and talk with you today. I, I've put a few slides together. Um, it's kind of not a super long presentation, trying to leave a little bit of time for questions afterwards. Uh, the topic today is the metabolic effects of aging. And I think that this is a particularly important theme as we consider you know, what's happening in the population of our country. There's more and more people who are aging longer. They're living healthier. Um, hopefully happier lives as well. And we, we need to do everything we can to prepare people for those cherished golden years. Um, so I, I wanted to talk what, about what we can do to help, and I'm not so much talking about the medicinal ways that we can improve our health and, and um, longevity, but I, I'm focusing a little bit more on what you can do without medicine. Um, we're all aging. I mean, the obvious fact is from the time we're born to the time we die, we, we've got a set clock. We're, we're gradually in the process of moving from Arnold Schwarzenegger to this gentleman who's still having fun, which I hope you all are, riding his motorbike. Um, what I'm not going to be able to do today is tell you how to get back to that youthful vigor that we were all enjoying uh, in the glory days of our, of our youth. Um, you know, hopefully science will get us there someday. It's just not there quite yet. So I have somewhat more modest goals today. And I wanted to talk um, about the hormone levels that change as we age, the metabolic changes that occur as we age, as well as what we can do in non-medicinal approaches uh, to help cope with some of those changes. So taking a step back and, and talking about this more generally, what is happening as we're aging? It's not all bad. We tend to get a little shorter, a little bit weaker, maybe a little bit heavier too. Gray hair or no hair like me, maybe a little bit slower, but we get smarter, right? We get wiser. All that experience, it starts to come to fruition, and our, our kids and grandchildren benefit from that. Peeling back the onion, another layer, though. Why are these things happening to us? What's going on? Why is our body, to some extent, not maintaining our prime? Um, and, and there are lots of answers to this. Uh, and, and I've listed some of those here. This is not an inclusive list by any means. But if you look at your organs, comparing the organ of someone who's, you know, say 20s, 30s, compared to someone who's in their 70s, and you, you put it under a microscope, what you'll see within that organ are that there are all sorts of areas that are a little bit more dense, a little bit more scarred or fibrotic. And this happens in all of our organs. It happens in our hearts, it happens in our kidneys, and our livers, it happens in our muscles. And to some extent, when this, this can become a significant enough change in those organs that they don't function as well anymore. That slows us down, makes us a little bit weaker, makes us a little bit more tired. Um, our nerves also tend to degenerate a little bit. The, the conduction between nerves slows down for some reason or another. Um, and we also tend to develop nerve injury as we age. Our muscles start to shrink. We reach our peak muscle mass sometime in our 30s, 
and thereafter it is a slow and steady decline. Um, and, and there's a lot of research being done to figure out what we can do to stop that muscle loss. We lose muscles, you know, we lose our strength, we lose our fitness, our ability to be independent, cope with life. Our bodies tend to start to develop inflammation systemically, everywhere in the body. When we get this inflammation, it increases the risk of getting diabetes, increases the risk of getting cancer, as well as other autoimmune type problems. And our joints tend to wear out. Beyond that, looking at an even smaller scale, our cells just don't work quite as well. They, over many, many years of having to maintain body functions, the efficiency of enzyme production and, and DNA production and replication, it, it slows down in the body. Um, and so it's, it's been, you know, kind of the holy grail almost. That we try and figure out why these things are happening, what we can do about it. And though we don't have complete answers to those questions, there have been some studies that have shown very interesting results. It turns out that there uh, is a key set of genes that seem to be turned on as we age. And I've listed some of the major players here. It's P53, P21, ATF4, FOXO, NF-kappa B, and GAD45A. If you look in, into the literature, these are going to be fairly meaningless, I realize, to most of you. But these are genes that help us deal with stress. If you don't have these genes, your bodies can't recover as well when they're stressed. Our DNA starts to get damaged. Um, so they definitely have a very important role in our bodies. But these genes also, over time, start to wear things out. These genes have been implicated in causing cancer, muscle atrophy, fibrosis in our organs. And one of the important things that people are working on is trying to figure out how we can control the regulation of these genes. The big question, of course, is, you know, these are good genes. We need them. So what's happening? At some point, these genes start to become a problem, though. And it almost gets down to the question of the chicken and the egg. What comes first? We need these genes, but these genes cause problems. We get those problems, and these genes keep turning on. It's kind of like this cyclic. Where, where do we begin? And part of the problem may be depending on your perspective, obviously. We live longer, and that's a great thing. It didn't used to be that these genes were probably an issue for most people. If you look at how long people were living back in the 1800s, early 1800s, um, it was much, much shorter length of life. The blue line represents uh, people living in developed nations, such as ours today. Um, the red line looks at uh, on average, and the green line, which is slightly below everything, is, is how long people were living in, um, in uh, developing nations. If you look at over time, it's kind of flat, maybe slightly increasing, particularly in those people who are living in developed nations. And then around the year 1900, you really start to see a takeoff. Um, and and this, is, this was an interesting point in history. It was around this time that we started to develop antibiotics, actually. So 1820, people were living maybe 35 years on average. 2000, average lifespan is about 80 years, a little bit longer for women, a little bit shorter for men. So I mentioned this time period and how things really started to change then. So if we look at what was happening in the year 1900 and why people were dying, it is very, very different than what is happening in 2010. Diphtheria, it's an infection. Um, GI infections, tuberculosis, another infection, pneumonia, influenza. These are all infections. But we've got great treatments for these things now. What we're dying of in 2010 is entirely different. We're dying of heart disease and cancer, and there's very little left that, we, that is an infection anymore. And this presents interesting problems to our bodies. We live longer, but our bodies, 
you know, subject to argument, I'm sure, weren't designed to live this long. So we get these genes being turned on, these genes that help us get through the first 30, 40 of our years. And then after that, they start to be a little bit of an issue. We live longer. We live healthier. Unfortunately, our youthfulness doesn't last. When we think about these changes that start happening in our bodies about the time we hit 40, which is the life expectancy of people living a century or so ago, uh, we start to see there are some significant changes in our hormone levels, and this definitely contributes to what's going on uh, with the expression of these genes that we talked about a little bit earlier, as well as our youthfulness and vitality in life. One of the big topics of conversation is testosterone. Obviously more of an issue for men than for women. Um, it tends to peak when we are in our 30s and 40s, and after that there is a slow and gradual decline. It's worth noting though that even at this point when we're elderly, testosterone levels are still within the normal range. There is a huge range of normal testosterone for men. It's not like menopause for women where they have an abrupt decrease in estrogen levels, and I have a slide about that coming up in a second. Men maintain testosterone levels throughout their life, but the testosterone levels are definitely lower. And there are medical conditions where it is abnormal and testosterone levels definitely go too low. And oftentimes in those situations, we do prescribe testosterone. And many of the patients that I give testosterone to come back and they tell me, you know what, doc, I do feel better. I feel like my energy level is 10 times better than it was before I started this. And I feel like I'm able to get out and do things. It is one way of approaching this. It doesn't work for everyone because the majority of people, even though their testosterone levels are going down as they age, they still have a fair amount of testosterone. It's a little bit different for women. So this graph looks at the few years immediately preceding menopause and those few years immediately after menopause. Estrogen levels cycle with menstrual cycles. So they go up and down a little bit, but what happens, uh, starts to happen a couple years before menopause actually, is the estrogen levels are rapidly declining. And uh, after menopause, within a couple years after menopause, they are very, very low. Um, the subject of hormone replacement in women is even more controversial than I would say the subject of testosterone replacement in men is. There was the Women's Health Initiative results that came back, came out, I don't know when it was, about a decade or so ago now. Before that, almost all women were on hormone replacement, it seemed. After that, everyone stopped it, almost cold turkey, and I can't tell you how many patients I came, that came to me afterwards and said, you know what, doc, I feel terrible now please put me back on it, but we didn't do it. Turns out there have been more studies that have come out since then that suggest, you know, there are definitely situations where we will prescribe estrogen replacement for women, and it turns out that it can definitely be a benefit, but it's not for everyone. So we're a little bit more careful now about deciding who takes es who should get estrogen and who should not. But it's one of those medicines it definitely can improve things a little bit in terms of how you feel, your vitality for life, as well as influencing your metabolic rate and uh, your fitness. A hormone that we don't often talk about is IGF-1. IGF-1 stands for insulin-like growth factor. It is the hormone that, that growth hormone is turning on. Growth hormone by itself doesn't do very much. It stimulates IGF-1. IGF-1 does lots of things. It increases muscle mass. It decreases your fat mass. It increases bone strength. It does lots of great things. And, that's, and it's no surprise when we look at it that IGF-1 levels are peaking when we're in our teens and getting into our 20s. That's when our body is finishing up growth, building up to that peak bone mass, building up to that peak muscle mass. IGF-1 is a key player in that, and it does gradually decline over time since then. We don't often replace IGF-1. Um, it's not an easy hormone to replace. 
And most of the studies suggest that when we do replace it, it actually doesn't help that much. Definitely helping during this phase of life. At this phase of life, there isn't any real conclusive benefit that it helps if you give back IGF-1 to people. So what are the effects of these hormone changes? Looking at them kind of uh, all together, um, when we lose testosterone, estrogen, IGF-1, we definitely have a shift towards increasing adiposity or fat. When you lose these, you also lose muscle mass. Muscle mass is a, a key component in determining what our metabolic rate is, how much energy we expend while we're sleeping and while we're doing things. Without these hormones, we also start to feel a little bit more down. We're a little bit yeah, less, um, psychologically speaking, ready to go out and do stuff. As a result of those, these changes, our metabolic rate goes down. We tend to gain a little bit more weight. Our bones also start to become a little bit more brittle. And overall, our fitness declines. And I'm not trying to paint uh, an overly dire picture of what's going on. There are definitely ways that we can cope with aging, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later in this slide. Um, if we look at what we can do to improve our fitness, to improve our length of life and our quality of life, uh, we come to this graph, which I think is pretty interesting. So this is preventable causes of death. So this isn't all causes of death that we're listing here. These are the things that we can actually do something about. And I just want to talk about the first two, because these are the big players. After that, it's not worth spending much energy or, or worry about. Smoking. I hope no one in here is smoking anymore. And uh, being overweight and obese. When you're overweight and obese, it increases the risk of all kinds of metabolic diseases. Heart disease, strokes, diabetes, uh, even, even cancer. Um, is increased in people who, who are overweight and obese. So this presents something that is a, a great point of intervention. This is something we can do about that is going to have huge ramifications down the road. If you look at obesity trends in the United States, um, it, it's kind of interesting. So back in the 1990s, most of the states that were reporting data are blue. So correlating with less than 10%, maybe 10 to 14% of the population um, being obese. Um, and gradually over time, we see that this, this starts to shift. The eastern half of the United States, particularly the southern states, um, it, it starts to, the, the incidence of obesity starts to go up there, and then it starts to spread across the United States. Up to 2010, when we see in the majority of states, there is about a 30% prevalence of obesity. What happens with this weight? It definitely impacts our lives. This, is, uh, this left graph is looking at women, the right graph looking at men. What we see on the bottom is a body mass index. This is a marker, not a very, it's not a perfect marker, but it just gives us an easy way of tracking things. So this is the BMI, looking at the relationship between your weight and your height. And it's, it's an interesting curve. If you look at people who have BMIs less than 20, they have an increased hazard ratio. Hazard ratio meaning risk of, of dying. With a BMI between 20 and 25, that, that hazard ratio goes down to 1. So that's kind of what they're setting the curve at. And then thereafter, um, the heavier you are, the greater the hazard ratio is. And it's the exact same curve with men. And when if you look at overall who is obese at what age, it's a very interesting curve. Um, so this is data that's not that old. So this is about 2010. We see that people who are 18, there's about 10% of them who are obese. Um, it tends to peak when we're in our 50s and 60s, and thereafter it starts to trail off. This is a, a kind of, you might say, somewhat surprising. 
And I would say the explanation for why there are fewer obese people here is because, unfortunately, they're not making it to this point of the curve. <laughs> so the simplest way to look at all of these associations between obesity, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cancer, Alzheimer's, not to mention all the other conditions that also associate with obesity, diabetes, such as gout, asthma, fatty liver disease, is that what makes us fat, the quality and quantity of carbohydrates we consume, also makes us sick. And here's modern evolution for you. The food choices that we make are very different than the food choices our ancestors hundreds of years ago were making. They were hunting, they were gathering. It was a very active lifestyle. Whereas, and they died younger, they did, because of infections. Whereas we go to the supermarket or McDonald's or wherever and it's easy, it's convenient, and it tastes a lot better. <laughs> so what's happening with this obesity? Um, if you recall the prior slide, this is a slide that's very similar, except instead of obesity, we're now looking at what's happening with diabetes across the United States over time. In 1990, the rates of diabetes are very low about four and a half, six percent or so. And then gradually over time, we now see that rates of diabetes are up to, you know, close to 10 percent of the population. So that's a huge change in diabetes. If you're looking at absolute numbers of people with diabetes, this is type 2 diabetes. Um, people who are in the 20 to 40 year age group, uh, there's about 2.6 percent of that age group. People who are 60 or older, there's about 23 percent of people who are in that age group who have type 2 diabetes. That represents 12 million uh, adult men in the United States and 11.5 and million adult women in the United States. So these are big numbers. Um, and I guess it's also worth mentioning that same trend in what happens with diabetes is also happening with other diseases. It's also happening with heart disease, um, cancer, uh, strokes, they all go together. They travel, unfortunately, in a pack. So what can we do about this? We can lose weight. That's hard. It's beyond most people, honestly speaking. Um, and I'm going to show you a few slides to suggest that maybe weight actually isn't the big problem. It's actually exercise. Exercise, how much do we need? And this is the part of my talk that I'm hoping you feel like you gain from. I, I've painted kind of a dire, maybe sober, sobering picture of what's going on in the United States. But there is something you can do about it, beyond going and visiting me or any of the other doctors and, and getting another pill pushed at you. Um, so in these next slides, I, I want to talk about exercise and what happens when we exercise, all the good things that happen when we exercise. And before I talk about those slides, though, I thought it was important to lay a little bit of groundwork so you'll understand some of these upcoming slides a little bit better. So um, these slides are going to reference METs. These are metabolic equivalents. It's a way of ranking exercise by how much energy you expend while you're doing it. Um, these are activities that you would do at home and how many METs you would expend per hour doing those activities. Sweeping the carpet is worth about 3.3 METs if you were sweeping a carpet for an hour. You're spending, expending about 100 calories every 30 minutes when you're doing that activity. Gardening, a little bit more vigorous, playing with the dog, washing, waxing the car, playing with kids, moving furniture. By the time you're moving furniture for a half hour, which I hope none of you are doing, and if you do, <laughs> that you're using proper back technique, you're up to six Mets, spending about 200 calories every half hour of doing that. And I'm not advising you go home and rearrange your house every week. Not worth it. There's easier ways. Sports and leisure. Volleyball is... is uh, casual volleyball. Most of the time when you're playing volleyball you're just standing there. So it's not much more vigorous or um, 
taxing than sweeping. Golf. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands to talk about golf, but I'm guessing there are a lot of avid golfers here. 4.5 Mets per hour. Dancing, which I'm sure all the women wish was happening a little bit more frequently. You've got 4.8. Backpacking, basketball, soccer. Um, and these formal exercises on this next slide, these are the things that are going to really get you going. Um, Pilates. Walking very briskly can get you five mets over an hour. Weightlifting. Swimming is up to eight. Calisthenics and running. So here's the good stuff. So that's the background. Kind of give you an idea of, of what we need to do, what we're talking about here. So this graph is, is, a, is a fantastic graph um, because it shows exactly how much you get from that exercise. So what we have on the bottom are people of a normal weight with BMI between about 19, 20, and 25. Overweight, which is a BMI of 25 to 30. Obese, BMI of 30 to 35. And morbidly obese with a BMI of over 35. And what they've done in the study is they've uh, looked at how much, how many METs people are doing per week in each of these categories. For people who have um, uh, our normal weight and they're doing over seven and a half METs per week, seven and a half, that's not much, right? That's sweeping your carpet for a couple hours or, you know, a couple hours worth of brisk walks for a day, not much. Um, they see that they are not losing any years of life. So this is, this is the benchmark. This is what everything is being gauged against. For people who have a normal weight, but they're only doing zero, somewhat more than zero, but less than seven and a half mets a week, they are losing about two and a half years of their life. Um, versus those who aren't doing any activity, they've lost close to five years of life. Uh, by that sedentary American lifestyle. Um, but it's interesting that even when this effect of exercise, even at limited amounts of exercise, carries forward through all of these different weight groups. Um, at the highest category of obesity, so with a BMI of over 35%, yes, they, they are losing some life, but if they're exercising, minimal amounts of exercise, they are still putting an extra four years on their life compared to those people who aren't exercising. And this is looking at what happens with a little bit more uh, of an intensity of exercise. So they go all the way from zero METs up to 30 METs. 30 METs still doable. If you're out running, remember, that's 10 mets per hour. That would be three hours of running a week, so still doable. A little bit harder on the joints, though. Um, so the more mets you put into your week, the risk of dying goes down. The more mets you put in, the more life you gain. Beyond looking at life, there's also great data showing that when we do this exercise, it actually helps prevent disease. So this is looking at fractures. This is a big problem. You get a fracture when you're old, it can be potentially life-threatening. It limits your independence, definitely limits quality of life. So when we're looking at this graph, um, pay attention to the bottom scale. This is the risk of getting a fracture. And what they've done in all of these studies, so these are all different studies that, where people have looked at what happens when you exercise to your risk of fracture. This dotted line going through the middle is kind of the set point where we gauge benefit versus uh, harm. Anything on the left side of that is a benefit, meaning your risk of fracture goes down when you exercise. Anything to the right, not good. There really isn't anything to the right. There's this one study where it kind of crosses, but even in that study, on average, 
there is a benefit to exercise. If you exercise, your risk of fractures goes down. And there are other studies that have looked at what happens if you're exercising even when you have osteoporosis. Does this effect carry forward then? And it does, actually. If you have osteoporosis, you do have an increased risk of getting a fracture. Turns out that risk of getting a, a fracture uh, is primarily related to the risk of falling. People who exercise tend to be a little bit more fit. They tend to maintain their balance a little bit better. And as a result of that, they fall less. So even if you have osteoporosis, if you maintain your fitness, the risk of getting a fracture is significantly less. Um, so this was a study I found where it was looking at exercise compared to medicine. <laughs> Doctors push pills. We push pills because we don't think people are actually going to start to exercise and lose weight. I love to take pills away. And I often do for my patients that exercise. Um, so in this study, they were looking at coronary artery disease, stroke, heart disease, and diabetes. And they were trying to compare the effect of exercise to the effect of some of the common medications that are required for these different conditions. And I don't want you to go home and look at this slide and say, I'm going to start exercising. Sorry, doc, I'm stopping all these medicines. That's not my point here. But what I am trying to show is that exercise, it is just about as good in each of these cases as taking any of these medications in terms of helping you cope with that disease, helping prevent that disease, and get over that disease. The big question is, how do I get this exercise in? It's good. We all know exercise is good. But how do I do it? Our knees wear out. We become winded a little bit easier when we age. But we still need to figure out a way to get it in. And remember, we're not trying to get up to the 30 mets a week. We just need to get some exercise in in a regular basis. And that has a huge effect on our fitness. It improves our, um, prevents heart disease, improves diabetes, prevents fractures, just by being able to get out and do something. The question is, of course, how do I do it? And this is the question I face every day, many times. And this is what I always tell people. There are exercises out there that are safe and don't put a lot of strain and wear and tear on your joints. Um, exercise balls. There are all kinds of exercises you can do with these balls. It does require a little bit more balance, per se. But even if you have problems with balance, you can figure out ways to use these balls where that's not an issue anymore. They have weighted balls. They have non-weighted balls. There are all kinds of programs, videos that you can get out there that show you how to use these to get an effective workout in a non-weight-bearing way that won't cause any damage to your joints. Exercise bands. So this one is even a little bit easier, I would say, than exercise balls. And you can get just as good a workout. You can get a great workout using those exercise balls, using these exercise bands. You can get as good a workout doing this as you could running a mile. Um, they're just stretchy, elastic cords, and you can use them in multiple ways to work all kinds of areas and muscles in your body, and it helps. The more you exercise, the stronger you get. The uh, higher your metabolic rate goes, the more muscle mass you get, the stronger your bones become. And also, the better it, it helps maintain and improve your sense of balance. Yoga and Pilates maybe more so the Pilates than the yoga, but you can also get a great workout this way. And what's nice about this one is that it's a little bit more social. We like to be social. No one likes to go out and exercise alone. Um, what, so what I hope you take from this, and this is my last slide, is that don't worry about the dire things that happen while you're aging. It's going to happen. It's going to happen to everybody. What I want you to focus on 
is that you can do something about this. Even if you don't lose weight, if you exercise, you will be healthier, and you will be happier, and you will live longer. So I'm closing with a quote here. Because of diabetes and all the other health problems that accompany obesity, today's children may turn out to be the first generation of Americans whose life expectancy will actually be shorter than that of their parents. The problem is not limited to America. The United States reported that in 2000, the number of people suffering from overnutrition, a billion, had officially surpassed the number suffering from malnutrition, which was 800 million. And with that, I would be happy to answer whatever questions you have. Yes, please. The question is, are there any uh, groups where people meet together and use these balls or these um, exercise bands? Um, and I can't point towards any specific group. It te I know that they happen, but it tends to be um, friends who are getting together and doing these things. So they're not broadcasting it as much. Uh, hold on, I, I, there was a question that I skipped over. Um, did you still have your question? Yes, please. I, I think Tai Chi is great. So while you're doing Tai Chi, you are increasing muscle tone. Um, while that isn't going to put muscle bulk on, that's not the point. We're not trying to get back to Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's great. It's, it's definitely equivalent to Pilates, I would say. Yeah. And it helps with balance. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. There is a club in our community called Fun, Fit, and Over 50. They've been around for eight to ten years and specifically chartered to combat what you're talking about, the adverse effects of aging. Uh, we climb Badger Mountain every Tuesday morning. We go on bike rides throughout the Tri-Cities, volleyball games, Bocce ball games, and we socialize uh, together, and it costs 20 bucks a year. That is great. Come find this man afterwards. Yes, please. So uh, the question is, um, is it our lifestyle, meaning the stress that we're all facing that, that is contributing to the rise in obesity and all these metabolic disorders? And... Um, there aren't any real firm answers to that I'm going to be able to give you on that one, unfortunately. So if you look at what was going on in 1990 compared to what was happening in 2010, why all of a sudden are people becoming obese and, and getting diabetes? Um, there were a couple, there are some changes in our diets that started happening around that same time. Uh, we started using a lot more high fructose corn syrup. Uh, fast food restaurants started booming. And um, we also stopped taking vacations as much and sitting at our desks all day long. Are, are we more stressed? I don't know. Um, I would argue also that the farmers back in 1900, they were pretty stressed, I bet. Um, but yes, we are very stressed. And what I can say is that the more stressed you are, you do get more inflammation in your body. And that does increase the risk of, of obesity as well as diabetes. That is unquestioned. Though. Yes, please. So the question is, are there pros and cons of weight-bearing exercise compared to non-weight-bearing exercise? And there are, actually. So um, the major difference is actually on the bones. So, and that works both ways. Weight-bearing exercise, it causes a little bit more damage, wear and tear on the joints. But at the same time, by participating in weight-bearing exercises, you also build more bone mass or prevent bone loss. When you do non-weight-bearing exercises, you don't get as much of that benefit in terms of helping bone mass or preventing further loss, um, but you still get a great workout. And if your joints don't let you do weight-bearing exercises, there uh, is no difference between the two in terms of how much of an effect you can make on weight loss or diabetes or heart disease. 
Yes. So the question is, uh, heart rate is very important. Do, do we need to monitor that during our exercise? And the answer is yes, um, but only as a marker of how intense your exercise is. So as we age, our heart, heart rate naturally declines. When we're 20, we can get our heart rate up into the 200s and it is perfectly safe while we are doing very intense exercise. By the time you're in your 70s, if you had a heart rate in your 200s, that would be a problem. Max heart rate, when you're getting into that age, you know, we're talking more like 150s, 160s. So um, the heart rate is a useful marker when you're trying to determine, is the exercise I'm doing intense enough that I'm benefiting from it? And we usually try and get, we don't want to get to our max heart rate, but we want to get fairly close. And you can use that as a, as a way of knowing that your exercise is working you out. You can also just pay attention to how you feel. If it's draining you and making you sweat, that works too. Yes, please. Thank you. And, and I, I should put a caveat on what I said about exercise. Don't go home and start pushing out 30 minutes a week. Build up slowly, but I do hope you go home and you start to exercise, that you start to make it a part of your routine, and that you start to do it with friends. When it becomes social, it becomes much more fun. Yes, please. Um, so there is a physiologic reason. Some of it has to do with those hormones that I talked a little bit about. So as those decline, um, our body's metabolic rate slows down. When our body's metabolic rate slows down, our bodies become a little bit more stingy with calories and that tends to accumulate fat. As far as specific areas in our body where fat accumulates, um, there is some interesting uh, data suggesting that that can actually make a big difference. Where your fat is um, can influence how susceptible you are to some of these metabolic diseases. Yes. So the question is, where does yoga enter into this? And um, I would say yoga is probably not quite as intense as Pilates or Tai Chi, um, but you can still get a great workout doing yoga, and you are definitely strengthening your core and improving your sense of balance. So it, it is a, a fantastic option. Yes. So the question is, is it a good thing to be taking protein supplements? And uh, I would say it depends on what your goals are. If you are trying to turn back into Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or trying to uh, get the crown for the most home runs, you need a lot of protein. So our, our muscles are primarily water and protein. It's the major, rep major repository or storage of protein in the body. And you cannot build muscle unless you have enough protein in your diet. And it takes a lot of protein to build muscle back up. So if that's your goal, yes, you do need to increase the amount of protein you're taking in. Is a, a protein supplement in a jar that you mix with water or whatever as good as having uh, some animal product protein or tofu or whatever? Uh, they're equivalent. And I think that's it. Thank you for your time.